Hi, and welcome to Missouri Athletic Club Connections, a podcast highlighting the foremost private club in St. Louis, known for attracting exceptional people and enriching lives for generations. Today, we will be discussing connecting St. Louis and sports with Martin Kilcoin. Martin is the sports director at Fox 2. Um, so again, the title of this podcast is Club Connections. Martin, what's your connection to the club here? Well, it goes way back. My grandfather, George Gilmore, was a member uh, yeah. back in the day. So when I was in grade school, we would ride the bus. And kids are like, what? You rode the bus? <laughs> right. You didn't get a ride? We would ride the bus down to the MAC. And we'd get off over there and buy a sandwich at the deli place. I guess we hadn't figured out how we could charge everything. But we would come over here, work out, shoot baskets, and turn around and get on the bus and go all yeah. the way back out to Glendale. Uh, but Grandpa George, for many years, and I, I, the first time we joined, I thought, I'll just put his number on there and just see if it <laughs> – I think that one see came bouncing back. But yeah. Grandpa would bring us here years ago, you know, Easter brunch, things, yes. events like yeah. that. My grandma loved coming to the club. She would say to my mom, we're going to take you to the club. And so years ago, came down here and – I've been to many events. Oh, and sure. Before we were members, my family, we would come to events here, and I would always kind of think of uh, Grandpa George walking yeah. through these halls. Yeah. Well, I love that. That's the, you know, we've done whole podcasts about generations of the club, and um, so we love those stories. You know, love the fact that uh, these memberships and these families have been around for so long. So we love hearing that. Um, but you, most specifically, obviously known for sports reporting that scene in st louis for many many years um you know tell us a little bit about maybe where you are now but some of the things you've done over the years here in st louis so i've been at fox 2 since it's right at this time it was july of 1997 there you go 25 years ago i thought i was a young kid back then uh but i had i had worked in tv i went to marquette in milwaukee for college and then i worked in a town flagstaff arizona okay I worked in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Everybody's going to be Big Googling, Googling these yeah. towns. Right. <laughs> and then I worked in Madison, Wisconsin, which is the state oh, capital. Yeah. And you've got Wisconsin Badgers. Yeah. And we'd cover the Packers a ton. So that was fun. But I was there a couple of years and then came to St. Louis. And I got here in 97. The Rams had been here two years, but they mm. were largely bad. The Cardinals were good the year before, but they were bad in 97. <laughs> but then all of a sudden, when I was here, they traded for Mark McGuire. Like after a couple of weeks yeah. after I was here. Things sort of picked up with him and the whole Cardinals story. It was Dick Vermeil's first year. Oh, yeah. And he and I have been friends ever since. But things were started. I'm lucky because things kind of went on the uptick. Cardinals were good for a long, have been good Maybe for a long Maybe a coincidence? Stretch. You come it's, it and has things nothing turn around. To, it has nothing to do with me. I'm just saying I've been lucky <laughs> since I got back here that so many big events have happened. I have friends that are sportscasters in other markets, and they say, man, I just want to go to one Super Bowl. I just want to go to one Stanley Cup. Yeah. I'd love to go to the World Series. I'm like, let's see, did that, did yeah, that, check, did that. Check, did check, check. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a great run for me personally being in your yeah. hometown. And when you work in other TV markets, you'll cover the local high school. I remember in Flagstaff, my boss said, okay, tonight you're going to the Coconino East game. And I'm like, okay, who are they playing? He's like, Coconino West. This is huge. I'm like, I'm sure it is. Like, yeah. you, just, you have no <laughs> right. frame of reference. Right. And so when you're in your hometown, you know, oh, yeah, well, Vashon's playing. They're good. And right. you know the matchups, the, the rivalries. And even in Rhinelander, after a couple of years, you start to learn. Sure. Oh, boy, if they play Anago, it's going to be a low-scoring game. You learn, but when it's at St. Louis and it's your background, you, you already know. know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Big, big deal. I like that. Um, well, on that same topic, because obviously you've talked about that long career in sports, um, where'd that come from? Where'd the love of sports come from? You know, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? I think I figured out, I mean, I wanted to be Jack Clark. I mean, I wanted to yeah, be Willie sure. McGee, and I yeah. figured out, okay, that's not happening. Yeah. And then I thought, you know, I wouldn't mind playing in the NBA. And I'm like, okay, after two years of high school basketball at CBC, I realized – I'm not good enough for varsity. <laughs> That's not it either. So I need a backup plan here. But even in high school at CBC, I was the editor of the paper, okay. and I had a column in there. And then when I went to Marquette, I was on the radio, college radio. I remember we had a clip of Marv Albert, and he was like, yeah. you're listening to Marquette College Radio. And we would play like a thousand times an hour. Sure. We thought it was so cool. Marv right. Albert mentioned Marquette. Uh, but growing up, you know, playing a lot of sports, never being really good at any of them, but I love playing. Listening to Jack Buck, yeah. I listen to a lot of sports open line. I remember Bob Costas when he was young, and yeah. I, I've told him, he's like, Martin, thanks so much for reminding me how long ago that was. I'm like, well, I was a little, <laughs> I was a little kid in the car listening. So yeah. I always gravitated to sports broadcasting. And I think like so many kids in St. Louis, I wanted to be Jack Buck. Sure. Which is impossible. I mean, first of all, there is no other right. Jack Buck. 
Um, but I wanted to be Dan McLaughlin. What he was able to pull off, and he's great at it. Yeah. And I think like a lot of kids that want to get into broadcasting, maybe that's the ultimate goal. Then you go in different directions, ended up doing TV sports. And I like the writing aspect of it still. You can kind of you know, carve out your own image, identity, shtick, whatever, by yeah. how you write, how you tell your stories. Well, and I was going to say that. That's what you get out of television is the story aspect. You know, right. You're actually telling that story. You're not. It's not so much of the... You know, cards win, you know, 42. Right. But you know, I, I learned that at Marquette, too. We did, you know, we had the radio, we had the TV. And I, yeah. I liked the idea of the writing and then the video going together. So it was yeah. more than just the, I love doing radio, but TV brings you both. You know, my greatest compliment of my work is probably my biggest insult. My mom, <laughs> loyal viewer. Okay. Yeah, and unless I'm off, then she'd be like, is Kusumano working? I'm like, Mom, Mom, don't change the channel, okay? Right. But she said, I love your nightly commentaries. The the Kill Coin yes. opinion is the TKO at 10 yeah. o'clock every night. We've been doing this for 10 plus years. Yeah. It's kind of a take on the day's news. Yep. Sometimes it's irreverent, and rarely is it harsh, but although with the Rams, I called for Steve Spagnuolo to be fired during the TKO. My boss said, you know, we're the Rams station. Yeah. That one... <laughs> That's a whole nother story. Didn't sit so well. <laughs> but my mom, one day, she called and said, you know, I really like tonight's TKO. And she yeah. said, who writes those? <laughs> I said, Mom, yeah, first of all, it has the name Killcoin <laughs> right. in it. It's got my name, and it says the Killcoin. You think somebody else is writing right. my opinion? Right. Now, if I could pay someone to do it, it'd be great. But yeah. So I said, Mom, I'm glad you like them so well that you thought somebody other than your son was capable of putting these together. Right, right. But it's fun to be able to write and have fun. And and, and, and they give me a lot of license there, too, because news a lot of times is when you're in the, quote, newsroom, yeah. it's all very factual. Yeah. Now, here's what happened today. And in sports, you can weave in opinion and be sarcastic, which yeah. is sort of my nature. And, you know, I did a commentary the other night. Everyone's talking about the Cardinals getting Juan Soto, the Blues yeah. getting Matthew Kachuk. So I started by saying, so Doug Armstrong walks into a bar and sees <laughs> John Mazalock and says, hey, Mo." You're going to get Soto? And then Mo says, only if you get Kachuk. Or what? And it was it was fun to be able to write it so non-newsy, just sure. kind of in my own style. And we've been able to do that for a long time. But I think that fits St. Louis, too. I think it's a, a key part of that. You hear, <clears throat> this is a great question for you. You know, What do you think about sports broadcasting in other cities? I mean, some of these other cities, you know, I know you said that about, yeah, I'm calling for, you know, th this firing and Spagnola, you know, right. during the thing. But, I mean, other sports cities, I mean, that's every night, right? I mean, every night is just, you know, there's not the lightheartedness. It's the, you know, this guy's got to go and, you know, we got to do this. Yeah, I think w traditionally, too, we think East Coast, New York, Philly, where true, they're a little, true. I mean, where they do yes. get wound up. <clears throat> Hal McRae was a, a manager in the big leagues and then he coached for the Cardinals. And I sat and talked to him for a while because he had been, all over, played all over, and, and I, I said, tell me about New York versus Philly. And he said, I'm going to yeah. tell you the difference. He, it's talking about the fans now, not the yeah. media. But he said, in New York, he said, they will get angry. Like, if you don't play well or you make a right. bad decision. And he said, in Philly, they show up angry. Right. And I said, okay, that's a good <laughs> distinction. But right. I think in this market, if you were overly critical all the time, People would be like, oh, we don't want to hear that. We sure. don't want to. And, and there's room. Sure. I'm certain. I'm sure there's plenty of people say, hey, this media in this town could be a little harsher, could drop the hammer a little more. Um, and I, with the Rams, it was hard because they were ripe for criticism because sure. they did so many things wrong and there were so many bad games. And then at the same time, I was hosting the coaches show on Monday nights. So we really had to yeah. kind of walk this line. And there was a coach who on a Monday – uh, called me over before we taped his show, and he was really mad at me. And it wasn't something I had said, but the night before on our Sunday show, Brian Burwell, who was the columnist for the Post-Dispatch, right. was critical of the coach. And I said, you know, I do your coach's show, and I said, I don't hammer you. I said, I politely ask the proper questions. You sure. can answer them however you want. I said, but on Sunday night when the game is over, I said, every NFL market – is breaking down the game, right. breaking down the decisions. Either this player didn't perform or this coach made a bad call. And I said, we're no different. I said, we're not going to. Yeah. I said, now, if it's me saying you're lousy and you're awful, and then the next day I say, hey, let's do the coach's show, that won't work. Sure. But our outlet for fans is still going to have criticism. And I said, and I, and I told him, I said, I don't think it was unfair. Yeah. And then we sat down and taped an awkward half-hour show <laughs> together. Extremely awkward. <laughs> so I think, to your question, uh, could there be more critique? Yes, I think certain markets demand it yeah. and require it. Um, 
but I don't think in St. Louis they want to hear a ton of that. Correct. You know, it's right. I, I liken this with the Cardinals. If you just go to Twitter or just go to social media, everything they do is wrong. Yep. Every manager's terrible. Every yep. player's terrible. And if you go to the game, those people cheer every player. They yeah. cheer. So the people who largely, not everybody, largely that support it with their pocketbook, go to the game, yeah. are pretty happy with the product. Yeah. And Bill DeWitt III, in a recent interview, he said, I still believe the ultimate voting machine in baseball is the turnstile. And he said, Very and if people show up, they either like the right. team or they like the experience. Uh, that doesn't mean they're perfect. But a lot of times the really heavy critique is by people who don't actually go to the games. Yeah. And it's just sort of their thing. And there's value in it. If I were – and John Mozalek in the past, I said he'd get on Twitter just to see what people were saying. Sure. And Bill DeWitt said, he goes, we're very aware of, you know, criticism of us and our team. And he goes, and sometimes it's valid. Yeah. And so it's probably helpful to hear that. But just overly negative, just to be negative, I don't think there's a market for that here. Yep. You know, I, I, I think, I people, would tune, I think people would tune you out. They would. But they you would. also want to – you want to keep people guessing a little bit. And I have told this Dick Vermeil story. So when he was the coach, he was real rah-rah. Yeah. And they'd have players meetings once a week. And the players are telling me this, that every Wednesday he'd tell you about a former player who this kid was the best kid and the toughest kid. And by about the fifth week, they're like, oh, here we go again. And so by that fifth week, he tells him about it, and he names the kid and the draft pick and where he went to college. And then Vermeil goes, this kid was a piece of Beep, you know, and, they're all, <laughs> and the players start laughing, like, right, oh, right. okay. Like, you have to be able to mix it up a little bit. Yeah. And I think if you just do the same thing, all negative, right. all positive, there is a tune-out factor. Yeah. Whether you're a sportscaster or a Hall of Fame coach like Vermeil. Yep, I get that. I get that. The mixing it up is very important, and I think that's what – I mean, any leader to any management position, oh, it's sure. probably, if you just have an employee and every day yeah. – Tell them how they're doing a terrible job. Yep. Or if every day, like, hey, everything's fine, everything's fine. I mean, there has to be right. a balance in that. Otherwise, right. nobody's going to learn or change. Yep. Uh, that was the big thing. Nothing's going to change. Right. right. Nothing will ever change. Perfect. Um, well, you alluded to this earlier, but I've got to ask. You you said you've been lucky enough to fall into some wonderful um, key sports moments in St. Louis. Okay. Got a favorite? Got a couple favorites? Yeah, my go-to, so for years, when people would say, and the Cardinals had so many big games sure. and big moments, but my favorite game that I covered, and so now I've done this. This is sort of like Tony La Russa would say tied for first, but what I've broken yeah. it down to, my favorite game okay. and then I have my favorite moment. Oh, and I, I've decided I could separate those. Sure. I mean, 25 years, I get two, okay? <laughs> 2006, the NLCS, Cardinals uh -huh. and Mets, okay. game seven. Okay. It's at Shea Stadium. Obviously, the winners go into the World Series. Yeah. Well, in that game, Jeff Supon gives him a winnable start. He wasn't a dominant ace, but he gives him a winnable start. Molina homers in the ninth. And, oh, yeah. my gosh, Yadier Molina was not a big home run no. hitter. They're going to win. Oh, my gosh. Adam Wainwright's a rookie. He's got to close it out. And I remember after the game, it was on Fox. That's the other thing I've been lucky is so many games have been on Fox. Oh, sure. We had Rams games when they yep. were good, Cardinal playoff games. I remember going on the field at Shea Stadium. And saying to Adam Wainwright, what were you thinking when they brought you in? He said, my only thought was don't get to Beltron. But what happened famously was a couple yeah. guys are on and Beltron gets to bat. And I was in the tunnel and the old, these old crappy stadiums. Right. You, can <laughs> you can say but it. Yeah. it was, but it had charm still, sure. though. And so behind home plate at Shea Stadium, there's a tunnel to get to the field right behind the catcher. But it kind of goes down like this. So you can't even really see. Yeah. You can just kind of see the catcher a little bit. I remember when the strike had happened, I could see the ball drop, like the curve. I literally yeah. saw it drop, and all the Mets fans are despondent. But in that game, Scott Rowland had had a bad series. He was arguing with LaRue, so they weren't getting along. Yeah. So there's all this Scott Rowland drama built into this storyline of that series. And – he hits a deep drive to left. He's about to hit a home run. Well, the left fielder for the Mets, Andy Chavez, like climbs over the wall and makes a great catch. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Scott Rowland just – and the only reason Andy Chavez was playing left is because Cliff Floyd turned his ankle earlier in the game. So if Cliff Floyd's out there, he's not he's catching that. Yeah. So I mean, all these different storylines happen. Molina, who is not a home run guy. Right. Wainwright's a rookie. And Shea Stadium is literally – one of those buildings you can still feel it shake. Yeah. And as they were getting a rally in the night, they're thinking, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. And when he got the strikeout, the place just went silent. And I remember Matt Dillon walking by. And uh, who's our guy that was in 
Oh, now I'm going to blank out. The, oh, Bull Durham. He was Lelouch, Nuke Lelouch, famous actor. Oh, Tim Robbins. Tim Robbins. Yeah. Okay, so Tim yeah. Robbins. What a great story when you can't remember their name. Yeah. Tim Robbins and Matt Dillon are walking by being ushered yeah. out. And just Mets fans. Yeah, and it looks yeah. so despondent. And then the Cardinals are going to the World Series. So that was right. my favorite game. Yeah. And uh, feel free to edit it down. But my fa <laughs> favorite moment was the Blues winning the Cup. Oh, yeah. Because the Cardinals had won World Series in their history. Yeah. Um, the Rams, when they won, unbelievable moment, unbelievable season. But there wasn't the same St. Louis DNA. They'd been here at yeah, the time five sure. years. It was fun. It was great. The players were Hall of Famers. But they didn't have the Blues right. aches and pains. They didn't have the 50-year burden. Right. And so when the Blues won the Cup, and to do it in a Game 7 yep. on the road in Boston, who had beaten the Cardinals in the World mm -hmm. Series in recent memory, and the Patriots had beaten the Rams, it just all sort of tied together. And after the Game 6, Sunday night letdown, everybody probably remembers the town. I mean, there were probably 100,000 people downtown on Game 6. Oh, yeah. Everybody just assumed, well, we'll win it, and here right. we go, wins right. the parade. Right. And then they lay an egg in Game 6, and everybody's thinking, oh, no, they're going to do it to us again. Right. We're going to be let down. And they didn't. They played great. Silence the Boston fans. Um, just because the Blues fans are so committed oh, and, had, absolutely. and and yep. never and turned their back on the so team yep. and – deserved it and we had asked every former blue whether it was kelly chase or brett hull or bernie federico every interview they did for 10 20 years like what's it going to be like when we win the cup what's <laughs> right. it going to be and they'd all had to answer that question what right. do you think it'll be like if it ever happens right and then it did happen in boston no less it was uh that was pretty remarkable so to me that moment is the biggest oh love that and and again i i would it wouldn't have been surprised if you picked something else, but it makes sense that that would. be. I mean, the Rams Super Bowl was doing great. sports is thrilling, but and the Rams at the time are like, this is unbelievable, and this, yeah. winning the Super Bowl. And it, I'm not changing the answer on the Rams because they're now gone. Sure, I just think the the vibe on the Blues thing. It well, was. I just, think I think you saw the you know again the the team that was put together for the Rams. But I think you still saw it coming sooner than you did the Blues. Does that make sense? I think you saw the team progressing throughout the year, whereas maybe it's the letdown factor. We just kept thinking the Blues just would not finish it off, right? I think that was it. Whereas I think with the Rams, I think there was you, you were believing momentum more building. momentum. Yeah. yeah, I think that's what the feeling was to me. Well, in a yeah. lot of moments, as we just kind of talk about over the years, big games, big moments, things that happen that I remember – Never were on TV, or we never were, sure. were covered. But before the, the Rams played Minnesota, it was the first playoff game. And I think people still, I mean, to your point, they were great. They were 13-3, and three, Marshall Falk, Kurt Warner, yeah. Isaac. Everybody knew how talented they were. But I think the world was still like, I don't know. The right. Rams, are, are right. they really any good? First playoff game is Minnesota. And I'm standing in the tunnel at the Dome. We had probably done a pregame show for three hours or whatever. And all of a sudden, here comes a couple of security guys, and they're marching out. They're walking Coach Vermeil. Mm-hmm. And, there, and so I'm in the tunnel. I just kind of like back against the wall to get out of the way. And I wasn't real cozy with him. I mean, he knew me a little bit, but he made a beeline. He walked over and he grabbed my hand and he said, we're going to kick their ass. And he, yeah. and, I, and again, you can beep it, but he walked away. And I was, I got chills. I'm like, oh my yeah. gosh. He was that committed and believing in that team. Right. And I was just like, wow, that was pretty cool. Yeah. And He's a special guy. That's he a, is. That's and a I, whole nother segment. Yeah. Um, but he's really a – and he, for a coach, is extremely secure in who he is. We were doing a live shot in 99. So we're live at Earth City at Rams Park. Yeah. And we're in a commercial break. And he's my guest. They had set it up and whatever, and they're probably – what are they, 4-0 or 6-0, and whatever they were. They were the talk of the league. Yeah. So he's going to be my guest. And we're just sitting in a commercial break. And sometimes it's awkward if you don't know somebody that well. And I said, Coach, I just want to apologize. I said, I was on the radio last year, and I said, you should have been fired. <laughs> and now, you have to understand, yeah. you're not going to say that to too many coaches, no, players, managers. No, no, no. But you knew with him, like, you had that it comfort was okay. level. Yeah. And I was on the radio with Danny Mack on KMOX, a Rams post game, where they were yeah. disappointing and terrible. And I said, yeah. this guy's got to go, or something to yeah. that effect. And uh, I said, you know, it's been bothering me, but I, I said on the radio, you should be fired. And he said, you know what? I probably should have been. <laughs> and I go, okay, I feel better now. Yeah, I feel Stand by. Better. We're Thanks. ready to roll. <laughs> hey, alongside the coach, you should have been fired last yeah, year, but yeah. now it's going to be the coach of the year. Me. Yeah, <laughs> that's the kind of guy he is. I love that. Well, to use your Stanley Cup, uh, I'm going to use that as a segue. Don't think this is too big of a reach here, but 
you know, something that the city waited for for so long, you know, that, that blues fans, the whole entire city, everyone just waited for that to happen. Coincidentally, something that's pretty big, maybe not a Stanley Cup big, um, next February, we're going to take to the pitch and we're going to play MLS soccer in St. Louis. Um, pretty mo- momentous thing for uh, St. Louis as well. What's your take on that? What's MLS going to mean to St. Louis? What's, you know, uh, what's your take on City SC starting up? I, I think it's huge for a couple of different reasons because we have the soccer community mm-hmm. who may not like baseball or hockey, maybe sure. didn't care oh, about yeah. the NFL, yeah. who's always been like, hey, I wish we had a pro team. We had indoor for a long time. Right. But I think that audience has been underserved in terms of having a pro team that they can buy their merchandise and go to their games, sure. buy season tickets. And that's a huge market out there, soccer in St. Louis. We know that. But also I think in the wake of the Rams, it was kind of like, can we get this done? And then the first vote failed. And I think yeah. a lot of us said, oh, man, it's just not going to happen. Right. So it's big. Just if it happened on its own, it would have been big. But in light of the fact it was a failed vote and it was going to die, and for several years we would always say, anybody hearing anything? Nope. Yeah. Anything going to happen? And then we would on the radio or TV say, what about the Taylor family? They ought to, And people would say, the Taylor family is low-key. They're great corporate citizens. Sure. They're incredibly <laughs> philanthropic. They don't do sports. Yeah. So we would always throw out, what about the Taylors? People would say, no. Are you sure Enterprise doesn't want to get behind it? No. And so you would just kind of sit there and say, well, it's not going to happen. And then yeah. lo and behold, because of them, right. they step up. And how do you get something done when nobody wants to spend any government money? Nobody wants yeah. to dig into the till anymore. How about if somebody says, we'll pay for it? Like, What's that? You yeah. want to pay for yeah. it? And I think it's going to be a model franchise. Everything they have oh, done absolutely. so far has been pitch perfect. It's not a pun. Yeah. Uh, the <laughs> stadium itself looks beautiful. Uh, again, Bill DeWitt the third. We had just done a recent interview, so these thoughts are in my head. Yeah, He was talking about downtown, mm-hmm. and there are plenty of struggles. It's It's got to be fixed. we got to do better. Sure. But he said, I find myself coming to work, and he said, and I get off the exit, and he goes, and I drive around the soccer stadium. Yeah. And he goes, I kind of remember what it was like when our stadium was coming, and I just kept thinking, mm-hmm. it's going to be so cool when this is done. And he said, I do it with the soccer, and he said, I'm, I can't wait for that to happen. Yeah. Now, are they rivals? No, but it still could, could be competition. Oh, sure. You know, a pro be, team. Yeah. You're fighting over corporate dollars yep, yep. and tickets. It's almost an overlap in terms of their season. Yep. He's not thinking about that at all. He's right. like, this is so cool for the city. He goes, and I hope it's something that is a catalyst yeah. for that area. Yeah. And maybe we can have sort of a connection from Bush Stadium to Enterprise over to the Centene, and then you get to St. Louis U, then the West right. End, kind of bring it all together. Now, there's a lot of work to be done. It's still plenty of issues. We know that. But I think the fact that it's downtown is huge. Yep. If they And I know the MLS pushed for that. And um, everything downtown. That's the other key. Yeah, oh, they're training. You know, no driving out to Rams Park or something. It's Correct. all the there. Training it's all and there. that's, I think, very unique because you might have a downtown stadium. Sure. Where is the team Monday through Friday, Correct. 9 to 5? Oh, they're out in the county. They've right. got a place over there. Like every team, that's sort of the model. Sure it is. And then yeah. on game day, we'll see at our stadium. No, right. they're headquartered there. Everything is. that. That's great. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I didn't grow up playing soccer. I am not a soccer expert by any means. But I think the way they've handled it, the way they've rolled everything out, they've got people so excited. I mean, they could sell 50,000 season tickets if they wanted to. I mean, sure. it only holds 22, sure. 24. Sure. But the demand is so insane. Massive. And, the, and one thing I've heard they're going to do, which is smart, they will not make every ticket a season ticket. They're going to keep I – mean, yeah. they could if they – I mean, but they want to have people who say, I'll buy a ticket. I'm coming to a game. Where do I get right. a ticket? Well, here's yep. the X amount that are left over. Here's your yep. chance to buy those. Because otherwise, some people might feel left out. Yeah. Uh, it's a good problem to have, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, I thought of a unique challenge for you. You know, now baseball for years and years, definitely hockey. You know, you, you brush up on your um, pronunciations. Sure. But you may have a whole new animal when uh, MLS this comes. This is true. <laughs> well, the goalie, and, and for our soccer insiders, they're like, oh, how do you not know this? But it's the goalie, Roman Berkey, yeah. was playing over in Germany. And it was the Borussia Dortmund. And I was like, Look Borussia at you. Dortmund. Yeah. Okay, that's the team he played for. Yeah. And again, the insider's like, we all knew that. But yeah. some of these team names, oh, let yes. alone, hey, we got a kid. He's coming from the Bundesliga. I'm like, all right, he's from the Bundesliga. So we're, we're, we're getting right. up to speed <laughs> on a lot of this. By the way, we're taping this at midnight. That's why we have cocktails sitting yeah. here, just in case yeah. anybody at home is wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, but your favorite cocktail. They did a little research, apparently. Yeah. The Manhattan is here. And I said, how do you know it's not my wife that goes to the club and orders the Manhattan? But 
No, those it was a the, lucky guess. It lucky, was a lucky guess. guess. No, <clears throat> yeah, the 1903 is probably what that is. If uh -huh, I had to there guess. There you go. So. <laughs> good, good call, sir. Good call, sir. Um, so a couple other things I want to touch on. Um, so we don't have this happen very often, but we had a loyal listener to the podcast actually ask a question. You alluded to this earlier, um, but here's the question a listener asked. What is it that makes graduates of Marquette University so amazing and just all around great people? Wow, that doesn't sound like a plant by your director of not communications, at all. Not at all. who's also no. a Marquette grad, Jim Wilson. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a Marquette contingent uh, in St. Louis, and my wife my wife calls it a cult. But the people that went <laughs> sure. to Marquette <laughs> sure. that are in St. Louis all kind of it's almost like people have that bumper sticker. It's a Jeep thing, and they're like, "Hey, you uh -huh. got a Jeep?" Which I never understood. But you have a Marquette, special wave and a handshake yeah, like, and all that stuff. We yeah. don't. Uh, <laughs> we still talk about basketball 365 days a year. Some mm -hmm. years we're good, uh, but Marquette's a great school. It's Jesuit. And it's not far up the road. You're talking yeah. five, six hours to Milwaukee. Um, there's just a lot of great alumni in this area. And we've got our golf tournament up and running the last 10 years. And now you're starting to see people come out of the woods. And yeah. there are people that are 10, 20 years older than me that I've met at our golf tournament because yeah. of the Marquette thing. And then I'll run into them in town. They're like, hey, I saw at the golf thing. So the Marquette family, I'll call it, uh, has expanded over the years in St. Louis. It's footprint. I went to CBC, which was Christian Brothers. I just happened to be wearing my shirt. Good and, then I, and then Good I went plug. to Marquette, so I go from Christian Brothers yeah. to Jesuit. You know? yeah. so let's, Christian <laughs> Brothers made the wine, right? They always had a, they had a winery <laughs> right. nationally right, or internationally. Right, right. And then Marquette, the Jesuits, drink the wine. Drink it. So you're all sanctified. All covered all. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. they bless it before yes. they drink it. Yeah. Uh, Marquette, great school. I mentioned it. Everyone says, have you mentioned lately you went to Marquette? I'm like, okay, I get it. Yeah. But great St. Louis <laughs> Uh, continues. Well, you know, we have all these clubs within a club. Maybe, you know, Marquette Alumni Club, yeah. something that's in the future. So we can roll that in. We'll get like Jim that. Wilson working on that. Uh, he'll he'll take care of that. Um, okay, so fun question. You've probably been asked this before, but okay. I'm curious. I want to okay. know the answer. If it wasn't sports casting, it wasn't broadcasting, what would you be doing? I love asking this question, and I hate <laughs> answering this question. Good, good. And I, a couple of times, even on some sports panels, I would say that, hey, if you didn't, yeah. Pan out in football, and then sometimes the player's like, I really didn't have a plan. I'm like, okay, <laughs> good thing you yeah. ended up catching 800 footballs <laughs> right. or whatever. Right. Uh, Mike Jones, the former Ram who made the tackle in the Super Bowl yes. and had been high school coach in the area for a while, I remember him saying, he goes, I was planning on being a firefighter. He said, I grew up in Kansas City. Okay. All of his relatives were. Yeah. So I, think, I go, now that's a good answer. It's a great answer. Mine has always been, I think I would have been a college professor. I would have okay. liked to have taught. Now, I would have had to have some more schooling probably. <laughs> and... I think my wife's like, you? you barely read books. You want to? I go, no, but I think I'd like working with college age kids. Sure. And teaching them. I said, then I'd be off in the summer. I'd go to all the games. She goes, is this for the social aspect? And I said, no, I would enjoy working with yeah. kids. And it's a different way of not performing, but speaking in public. Sure. You're keeping them interested because yeah. we've all had teachers who weren't good at presentation. Uh -huh. And I always thought that'd be kind of fun to be in the classroom and wouldn't have to be broadcasting and I still might do it at some point even on part time just yeah. broadcasting and which keeps changing and the kids could probably teach me how it all works now <laughs> yeah um, but that's that's sort of my backup my dad was a doctor I, I'm scared of the sight of blood so like that was never I, the only thing no I inherited, family business the only thing I inherited okay. from him was a bad signature bad hand, handwriting the doctors yeah. always have my dad and I both have that but I would say professor perfect I like that answer Love that answer. All right, next one, and I'm going to give you a little uh, tidbit. Uh, uh, Will there be caramel rolls served at this at any point or no? Oh, okay. Anytime you like, okay. sir. Anytime you like. Um, nice plug for the famous right. Missouri Athletic Club caramel rolls. Um, so interesting people, interesting figures in local sports. And I will tell you that you would have no reason to know that I was there. But a long time ago, uh, it was Marshall Falk's roast okay. at Lumiere <laughs> Casino that you hosted um, which was probably the most hilarious thing I've ever seen in my life. We'll have a few more of these and we'll discuss because okay, yeah. someday I got to hear. I, I was there to watch it. Right. I'd love to hear what happened before and after it yeah. <laughs> because it had to be an interesting time. But that's just my example, my segue into the fact that you've had so much access, so many interesting people, so many interesting sports personalities. Um, so, you know, what's a, a one or two highlights of interesting people, sports personalities in St. It's, Louis? It's interesting you bring up roast because it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, it's not always politically correct, but the Blues have held these for years. Yeah. We got Darren Pang really good a couple of years ago. <laughs> uh, the Marshall Falk roast 
to me was really interesting because the night before his agent and I, so we had done his TV show. So I knew Marshall. Yeah. This is after he was retired. He was going into Canton that summer. So we yeah. had a roast. And his agent, Mark, uh, Rocky Arsenault, was Marshall's agent, lived in town. So we went to dinner the night before, and we said we have Steven Jackson, the Rams running back, who mm -hmm. had kind of an awkward start with Marshall because he was coming in yeah. as Marshall was yeah, coming out. Trade -off, yeah. We had Coach Vermeil, mm -hmm. We had Jackie joyner Kersey, uh We had Michael Irvin. And that so was... <laughs> we sat at dinner and kind of like a baseball manager, we're trying to make out our lineup. Yeah. And we're like, who should go first? Who should lead off? I said, because we got a pal, you know, and everybody brings something different to the table. And I remember, I'm pretty sure we went with Michael Irvin first. And we said, he's so dynamic yes. and, and interesting. But he gets up there, and you probably recall, uh -huh. he's going. And he's almost like a preacher. He's yelling. Yeah. He's, and, and it's Michael Irvin. He's having a great time. And the organizer of the event like, taps me on the shoulder. I'm off to the side and said, you got to get him off the stage. I said, me? I'm going to tell Michael Irvin to get off the stage? <laughs> right. I was the host. And, right, right. But I had set him up and brought him up. And they said, you got to get him off. I said, I, I don't know about that. I'm not... So eventually he stops and I get the mic and everybody cheered him. And I said, you know, they told me to get you off the stage. And I said, we all know the only way to stop you is with flashing red lights. <laughs> he had recently yeah. been arrested. Right, right. And people kind of groaned. Yeah. The person who laughed the hardest was Michael, Michael Irvin. Irvin. He couldn't even sit in his seat. Oh, I mean, there were so many times he's just falling and, on the floor. And, yeah, right. he was great fun. And then after it was over... My wife hates going to these events. She goes, it's so embarrassing. You say so many mean things. <laughs> Michael Irvin comes over, and I remember he said to my wife, he goes, I like this dude because he don't care if you're purple, pink, white, <laughs> right. whatever. He's going to make fun of you. And then Michael Irvin gives me a big kiss on the cheek. And for a long time on my Twitter handle, that was my picture, <laughs> Michael Irvin. Right. And years later, doing a radio interview with Rick Riley, who had written in Sports Illustrated. Then he was at ESPN. And he's coming on. We're recording this interview. And he said, can I ask you something? He said, I, saw, I looked you up online. He said, yeah. is that Michael Irvin kissing you? And I said, it's a long story. <laughs> right. but, but the answer is yes. yes. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed doing those events and even just hosting. I do like hosting events, yeah. especially if people are willing to have a little fun. Yes. And everybody's been to so many dinners where, and it was Jack Buck who would famously, you know, he, would, he was the roast master. Yeah. And I saw one of his events and he said, is everyone enjoying that chicken meal in front of you? And everybody's like, sure. And he goes, good. It's been sitting there since midnight. Like, he always had these <laughs> great lines. Um, but getting to do events with Isaac Bruce since he retired. Because when he was a player, yeah. he was a great player, but wasn't real talkative. And now we get these events, and he's roasting me back and letting yeah. me have it. And I, I just – I love the ad-lib dynamic, too, where you just kind of yeah. go and give people a hard time. And uh, there's been a lot of those kind of – I mean, I think access – even I mentioned Jack Buck earlier about the influence. I mean, for me to be a young kid in the old Bush Stadium dugout doing, like, reports back to the station, and one of the nights my guest didn't show up, or something, and Jack mm -hmm. Buck is sitting there in the dugout getting ready for his radio stuff. Yeah. And he, I'd probably met him a handful of times at that point, and I went over and I said, Mr. Buck, Mr. Buck, can you join me in, like, two minutes? And he's like, I'll do it. You got to tell me who stiffed you. And I said, <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. I said, no, I said, so I said, you are the – only person I would have, and he's like, you wouldn't be asking with two minutes to go. Right. Like, and I said, I think it was Walt Jockety or something. He got yeah. stuck in a meeting. Is all right, that's fair enough. And he just wanted me. Right. Be to, honest. Be honest. Yeah. Say, who, who am I replacing? You know, right. what, what level of prestige is there? So just for me to be around people like him yeah. and even to get to know like a Bob Costas, who was one of my sure. role models as a kid, hearing him on the radio, watching him on TV. And even when I was an intern one summer – uh, I was an intern at Channel 11, and we they had the Cardinal contract, so we were down at the stadium a lot. And my cousin John and I were at the game, and Bob that night happened to be filling in on Cardinal Radio. He was already a network star, and I said, yeah. i got to meet him because I need – whoever I can meet in this business, it will help. Right. And he's getting on the elevator, leaving the old press box, and I just kind of panicked because I'm like, I'm going to miss him. And I yelled, Bobby! <laughs> I was like 20 or 21. <laughs> and he looked like surprised, like, who's yeah. calling me Bobby? Right. You know? And he came over and was super polite, and he said, yeah. my recommendation to you, he said, when you graduate, sports jobs are hard to come by. He said, what you should do is, he said, take any job you can get. He said, if you yeah. could read the hog reports in Iowa, he said, do it. Then you get to know the boss, and then you're doing the Friday football. And, right. you know, and it was great advice. I, of course, didn't follow it. I was like, <laughs> I'm getting a sports job when I get out, and I had to wait a while before the job in Flagstaff. But I think just you know, access to those folks yeah. and to be around them. And Joe Buck is been great to me 
Um, you know, over the years, the actual players, the sports legends that we've had in St. Louis. I mean, Ozzy Smith is a yeah. huge name and extremely charitable with his time. And so every once in a while, I'll have an event with a, some other group, and I'll say, what do you need? And like, can you get somebody coming? Jackie, do you want to curse? Like, sure. Ozzy, sure. Yeah. Isaac Bruce, sure. And being able to lean on some of those people and know that they'll respond has been just unbelievable. I mean, I got to go to the White House with the Blues. Oh, for, Stan- did you? Nice. Yeah, for the Stanley Cup. It timed out. The Cardinals were there at the NLCS against the Nationals. Yeah. Uh, getting beat soundly. But yeah, yeah. while we were there, the Stanley Cup happened coming through. at the White House, which nice. was sort of cool. And at that same event, Layla, the Blues super fan, yes. was there. And I'd gotten to know her family during the Blues run. And the whole backstory to that was in the fall of 2018, I get an email, no, a text from Joe Buck. And he says, yeah. check your email. Okay. Yes, and then, sir. <laughs> and I checked my email, and Joe had forwarded something, and, he, and he, he said to me, he said, do something on this. It was a friend of a friend yeah. who told the story of this young girl, Layla, and what right. she was going through. And the family said, we really want not media attention for her, but Be The Match is this great organization. And they yeah. said, there's so many kids like this who don't have a match. We're trying to get the word out. So we started with this one story. We did a couple follow-ups. I've become yeah. friends with the family. Uh, and, I, and I always tell Joe, it all started – because you, you, you said, yeah. read your email. And then the email said, do something on this. I, <laughs> right. I went to work. I said, I got to do a story on right. this young girl. And it became a thing. And and she was at the White House that day, too. So uh, it all nice kind of circle. Yes. Well, and those are th- that that quick clip. I mean, you're talking about two minutes there. Um, that is plenty to tell you how impactful St. Louis is as a community in the sports world uh, in general. Um, you know, just the names you're mentioning, the impacts, the reach, um, you know, things that started here, their connections still back to St. Louis. Um, yeah, wonderful sports city. We all know that. Yeah, and Aeneas Williams, a retired Ram, Hall yeah. of Famer, lives here. He had lived in Phoenix. He's from New Orleans. He said, I've never seen a city so charitable. And probably because he sure. gets called a lot. Hey, can you give me sure. a football? Yeah. yeah, you got something? Can you sign something? <laughs> hey, can you get so-and-so to show up? And yep. those guys hear plenty of those types of requests, but I think it is true. I mean, you can't, and you know, at the MAC, there's yeah. there's an event, and what's that for? Oh, who's yeah. raising money, and yeah. who's, I mean, constantly philanthropic projects that are going on in St. Louis, which is great. And people could pick and choose. Hey, this is my particular cause. We all have sure. friends who are passionate about different things, um, but but the sports celebrities in this town have been great with their time over the years, and. And sometimes it just gets people in the room, and that's what you do. Is oh, it, sure. And, hey, so and so is going to be there. Oh, I'd love to hear him talk, you know. And one year at Joe Buck's uh, golf tournament, he used to have it out at Boone Valley. He still holds it for Children's Hospital. And uh, the night before, and he had all – I mean, he had Rush Limbaugh, Chris Collinsworth, Pete Rose. I mean, every hole was a major yeah. – and somebody came to he goes, hey, can you play tomorrow? I said, play? What do you mean play? He goes, you, you'll be one of the celebs. I said – you have yeah. Chris Collins with Pete Rose. I right, said, right. I, go, I go, they can introduce me. I go, that's embarrassing. And he goes, you're playing with the Sun Trips. They don't care. It's fine. It's fine. I said, okay, okay. That was the MAC team. Okay, fine. Yeah. They, they, they were fine with it. But just seeing, even interviewing Pete Rose and just sitting there talking and sure. going to Cooperstown twice when Ozzy went in, when Whitey nice. went in, just walking those little streets and seeing people from St. Louis. I ran into Bob Cos in the streets of Cooperstown when we were looking, we were going to meet Bob Gibson or something and – just really lucky. And you hear people say that, but really just to be around these yeah. incredible sports legends. And even in Rhinelander, a lot of my buddies now we look back and when you're in a small market in TV, you're constantly making a tape because you're thinking, well, I sure. got to get somewhere else. I got to get somewhere better. I got to get somewhere else. But I was covering ice fishing, which I <laughs> had never covered. Yeah, We had the snowmobile derby in Eagle River, which is the world championship snowmobile derby. It's about 30 below. And now I'm like, I wish, I mean, I had fun doing it. But in the moment, I was like, oh, I got to get to Madison. Right, oh, right. I want to work in St. Louis. Right. This is and it's so true with anybody in their job, like in the moment yeah. or in a season for a team. I'm like, I I did have a lot of fun. And my buddies and I, you know, we'd go out to the, the Hodag Bar was our hangout. And you might get paps for 25 cents or something, you know. And <laughs> now it's probably up there going up to 50. Sure. But great experiences, even non-sports legends. Yeah. Just fun covering, you know, small town stories and well, the first time I covered ice fishing, I was like tiptoeing on the ice because I'm like, I've never yeah. walked on a frozen lake before. Right. What am I? And meanwhile, I'm I'm walking in this like pickup truck, truck drives by, it was <laughs> flying by, and they're like, it's fine, it's yeah. okay. But I remember that story. All these guys are playing Nerf football. They're all drinking beer and they're grilling out. And I said, 
what is anybody fishing? Right. And they have the tip ups in the sure. hole. I said, it doesn't look like you guys are really doing anything. They go, are you going to report this on the news? <laughs> because our families might be watching because <laughs> right. they were all out right, ice right. fishing. <laughs> right. It looked like more of a tailgate than anything. Yeah. yeah. And I got to go to Lambeau Field probably 20, 30 times for work Ugh. when I it's worked in Rhinelander right. and Madison. Yeah. And we did a Monday show with Brett Favre on yeah. satellite. I was in Madison. He was in Green Bay. Uh, getting to just go back and forth with him. And, yeah. You know, I again, fortunate, lucky to be – I mean, just to be at Lambeau Field, even if they played a bad game and lost, I'm like, I'm on the field at Lambeau right. Field. My buddies right. in St. Louis would kill just to be there one time. Right. Well, even even without a game going on. Right. Just go to Lambeau <laughs> right. Field. Just to walk on the field. I tell people, like, ah, oh, it's probably there 20 or 30. like, what? At yeah. Lambeau Field? I'm like, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't mind going back. But I've been there, you know. Right. But, again, lucky. Spectacular. Um, well, anything else you want to share about uh, the sports scene in St. Louis? Anything we didn't talk about? Um, I think looking back, for me, it's these 25 years. Yeah. We have been pretty fortunate in terms of all these moments that sure. have happened. Sometimes your team loses. Sometimes they come up short. But on the whole, the Blues are always competitive. Mm -hmm. There was that stretch where they just couldn't get through in the playoffs, just in even recent years before they won the Cup. Cardinals were really good. Now they're at a point where they're pretty good, and mm -hmm. we'd like them to get to be really good. And that's been kind of my mantra, even to the team, is, hey, you guys are good. What's yeah. it going to take to be great? How do you get to that next level? Um, but I think a sports fan in this town is in a pretty good spot. Oh, and yeah. with soccer coming, you have more options now. Yep. If you like college sports, you get up the road to Champaign. You get to Mizzou. It's yeah. close by. And even the NFL, if you're, if you're bitter and you hate the NFL, I don't argue with anybody. Sure. Uh, but if you still want to take your kid to a game, I mean, how close is Nashville? How close is Indianapolis? You can go to Kansas, Kansas City. Kansas City, yeah. There's tons of football all within the region here if you right. want to go catch a game. And even the NBA, you can run down to Memphis, go to Indy. So I think we're in a good spot. If you're a sports fan, there's there's plenty to be had. Okay, so I want a hot take from you. All right. Because okay? I've heard this Hold from on. some okay, other this people. Is, okay, this is a hot yep. take. Here's the hot take. Okay. <laughs> Blame the 19 any, number three. <laughs> any chance on the NBA? What's your thoughts on that? I would say no. Okay. Um, I guess that's not a very hot take. But <laughs> well, no, it's still a hot take. Well, I think I think the best chance for the NBA in our town, and yeah. we especially now that we have Jason Tatum and Bradley Beal, yeah. it gets us thinking more about not only our love of the NBA, and for some people it created an interest in the NBA, just those two guys, sure. but it, you're like, wow, wouldn't it be great if they played here? I think the best chance when Bill Laurie owned the Blues, he went and bought the Vancouver Grizzlies. Yeah. And I think he even bought the Nuggets. He bought the Nuggets and Lanch first. That fell through. Okay. Then he bought the Vancouver Grizzlies because Bill Laurie owned the hockey team, the Blues. I don't know why I would say the hockey team, <laughs> but the Blues. He really loved the NBA, yeah. and he wanted basketball. And he thought the model works. If you have a stadium where two tenants, yeah. you sell some corporate packages to, sure. for both. All these things made sense. And he was going to move the Grizzlies, and that deal fell through up in Vancouver. They were obviously moving because they went to Memphis right yeah. down the road. But Mark Sauer, who was the CEO for Bill Laurie, the Blue CEO, I brought this up on a podcast and said, did we get close? And he said, he said, let me just tell you, after the Grizzlies thing, he said, Bill couldn't even get his call. This is a billionaire. He couldn't get a call back from the NBA. He said, so it was not happening. So yeah. things change. Could it ever happen? Maybe. But I don't think it's – I don't feel like it's like – I think some of it too regionally because you've got Memphis – and Indy are so close. Well, you know, somebody's got to make stuff happen. So here's my proposal okay. to you. I, Rodney's going to make this happen. We are. We are. The okay. MAC's behind this. So I've Let's heard. Start with the lunch buffet. Get a couple guys around. Okay. A few Manhattans. There's, yeah. There's, I mean, there's probably so, a Cantwell up there right now. Okay, oh, yeah. at least one of Somewhere, them. Somewhere, yes. Um, Pelicans for sale? So bring the Pelicans home, which is a mantra on Twitter people are saying. Bring the yeah. Pelicans home. Let's well, just, there, let's well, just go are, get a buyer's group together. I got a few bucks I'll pitch in. Okay, and there are, we can make this happen. There are markets where you're like, is it ever going to turn around? I mean, right, Charlotte right. lost a team, and then they got right. a team back. And New Orleans seems like just not the greatest fit. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it would take, I think, it doesn't even have to be local. I guess we did that with the Rams. Would I say when they were for sale before Kroenke right. uh, bought them, we were always saying, well, who's got the money local? Right. And, and somebody said, your owner can be from anywhere. And if you think that's about true. it, it's true Very in a true. lot of markets. The right. owner isn't from that town, right. so that's not a requirement. Um, I guess you could sell them on the fact that the Enterprise Center is now a top-notch arena. It right. wasn't for a while. There's right. been a lot of upgrades there, so maybe that's a selling point. 
Um, all right, it almost I'll, seems to be even built more you for seem NBA determined now. that this is going to happen. Right, okay, we're, we're going to talk about does, this offline. Okay, yeah. offline. I like yeah. that. <laughs> offline. So I don't think it's happening, but I would love to see it. All right. Well, we'll work on that side project. Yeah, I'm okay yeah. with it. I'm not against okay. it. I'm just not yeah. thinking it'll happen. Yeah. That's all. We'll take it. We'll take that. All right. We'll have. We'll invite the team over for a little lunch scrimmage in the. Oh my gosh! Be gumbo basketball. day. Come on. Yeah. If they come oh, yeah, down buffet. for gumbo day. I was even day. thinking the basketball indoor you know, basketball. We'll get them at our, you know, yeah. mural games. Right. And exactly. The, it's it's a shoe in. We'll we'll take care. Rodney's of that. trying hard to break news here. So far, I'm shooting yeah, we'll find down something. all these ideas. We'll find something. Um, well, hey, I got to tell you, uh, this has been an incredible conversation. Have absolutely loved this. Loved learning more about the inside uh, side of sports here in St. Louis. Um, but to learn more about uh, connecting St. Louis with uh, our sports history and sports today, you can contact uh, or get uh, in touch with Martin at mkilcoin at nextstar.tv. Am I getting that right? That sounds so, right. That sounds like my work email. Yes. Yeah. yeah. M M K I L K O Y N E. We'll put it on the uh, the screen. Uh, at it might have been a C in there next somewhere. At next star. We'll, we'll correct TV. all that in editing. Or look and make for me sure at the, the club. Right yeah, or my exactly. family loves the West uh, yep. Campus. Go, Go hang out with them at the pool. So yeah, and the family. Kids run around out there. It's a great spot. It really yeah. is, and we we utilize it a lot. The reason uh, Grandpa George, where it all started, yeah. was an MAC guy. Then we joined out west in part because of my son in. The winter, I said, we got to have a place to shoot some hoops. And that's yeah. how we got re-engaged with the club. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, love hearing it. Loved having you on today. Um, we'll have you back on when we can break some news stories like the NBA. All right. Rodney, <laughs> cheers. Thank cheers. you for having me. These are, these are not just props, folks. They're not. Thank you so much for being on.